Good afternoon. I bring you greetings from the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry, the United Methodist Church, the Reverend Greg Berquist, our General Secretary, and my boss, Dr. Mark Hanshaw. I am grateful to Dr. Williams for this invitation, and today my topic is Ida Wells Barnett's voice still pleads for justice and fair treatment. Are we listening? Much has happened in the 89 years since Mrs. Wells Barnett's death in 1931, and historians usually decide what was monumental, what was important or memorable enough to write down for posterity. For Ida B. Wells, thankfully, her legacy hasn't been left up to the whims of historians. Many of the descriptors historians use to describe her and her lifetime of contributions still sound the same militant, courageous, determined, impassioned, and aggressive. Mrs. Wells Barnett was an official rowdy, a rabble rouser, a crusader, a freedom fighter, a phenomenal woman. And she's been dead longer than most U.S. citizens live, yet she left behind footprints worthy of emulation, worthy of celebration. She stood tall when those around her shrank into the shadows. She risked it all literally for what we have become today. So now the question remains, was her life worth it? In 2004, on the 50th anniversary of the Brown versus Topeka Board of Education Supreme Court decision, I did extensive research in what I call the children of freedom, those first students who were sent into formerly segregated schools. I hadn't given much thought about how something could be desegregated but not integrated until then. But in my interviews with these children, who are now adults almost 55 years old, I listened carefully with my heart in my hands. Many of them were still raw, the memory too painful and too fresh to recount, and some couldn't even talk without weeping, and the pain and anguish poured from them deep inside. As I quietly agonized with them, I asked, if you had to do it all again, would you? And without hesitation, they said, absolutely, because they believed they were investing in the future. And so Mrs. Wells Barnett left Holly Springs, fled Memphis, turned Chicago upside down, and never relinquished her platform, believing that she and her sacrifices, her conquered fears, her sleepless and restless nights were all an investment in the future and yes, worth every moment. From everything I've read, she didn't die disillusioned, she didn't die beaten and defeated, she died triumphantly as a great woman. And in 2020, I proudly honor and salute her. Today, I have two questions I'd like to briefly discuss. Number one, why does her voice still matter in 2020 and beyond? And then number two, how do we choose and stay true to her cause of justice and fair treatment when there's so many distractions? I'll tackle the last question first. How do we choose and stay true to this cause of justice and fair treatment when there's so many distractions, distortions, and problems to contend with? Let me say first, there are no easy answers, and finding a solution is kind of like diagnosing the human body. Everything is connected to everything else, and you can't operate on one thing until you see its root, ca its root causes and then how it relates to everything else. From COVID-19 and the pandemic surrounding it to determining if and which black lives matter to being concerned about the suppression of votes and the attack on voter registration to immigration to health care and health disparities to policing, whether to fund or defund entire departments, law, disorder, the list goes on. Does the criminal justice system have any justice in it? Or is it just us? Then there's social justice reform and the disruption of the seamless pipeline from the schoolhouse to the jailhouse. It's enough to make you want to throw up your hands, as uh, soul singer Marvin Gaye puts it. It's easy to, number one, be overwhelmed, or number two, diminished, or number three, all over the place. And yes, Sister Wells Barnett, 
the crusader for justice calls loudly to us from eternity, from the depths of her being, and reminds us to stay focused. She said, take a seat at the table, then make room there for your sisters and brothers. She's begging us to stay focused on building the beloved community through unity, justice, peace, and advocacy. She's singing, walk together, children, and don't you get weary, because there's a great camp meeting in the promised land. That's our destination and we must keep our eyes fixed on the prize and not the shiny objects on aisle three. How do we stay focused and true to our cause of justice and fair treatment when there are so many uh, distractions? First, we can be thankful for technology. Rodney King was not the first African-American to be savagely beaten by the police, but this time there was visible proof of what had happened, so that fact could no longer be disputed. Nowadays, not much happens without cell phone or other video capturing and displaying it, and today, whether we call the names of Brianna, Sandra, George, Trayvon, Eric, Ahmad, and the countless others, we must also say that us, Killing us is wrong, and we must call those names too. We must repeat the names of the young men whose visions we will never see, the old men whose dreams will never come true, the three-year-old boys who are sleeping in their beds, and the eight-year-old little girls out riding their bikes. We must repeat those names, the names of the innocents who die every day and every weekend in our cities at the hands of gun violence, gang activity, drive-by shootings, and the bullets with no names. These sons, and, these sons and daughters will have no opportunity to prophesy. Their prophecies will be interred with their tiny bones, and the Spirit of God described in Acts 2.17 that spirit we so desperately need in these last days will fall from us. We must say their lives matter too. Their interrupted lives, their big dreams and mighty hopes must not become so commonplace and insignificant that they barely warrant a news mention except in the 60-second statistical roundup at the end of the newscast. Whether the bullet or the chokehold came from the police or Pookie and Ray Ray around the corner, those lives have been snuffed out. Those lives matter too, and the losses are very real. In addition to being thankful for technology, we must pay attention and mobilize. Every time I've been in court, for whatever reason, the young men in orange jumpsuits and chains shuffling in breaks my heart. The judges speak to them in a disparaging way, and they get punishment that seems out of line for the crime. These young men are alone. They don't have high-powered, expensive lawyers, and in most cases, they don't even have an overworked public defender. We must go to court and observe the proceedings so we can hold our judges and prosecutors accountable for fair and equitable treatment, for the tone of their voices and the purpose and intent of the punishment. We must insist on humane treatment of prisoners and rehabilitation and education opportunities to prevent recidivism. Before our children end up in prison, we must build success into the K-12 system. A child who can read and write on grade level is much more likely to graduate from high school than one who struggles with the fundamentals, with no parental involvement, with large, faceless classrooms, unstable homes or homelessness, an incarcerated parent, indifferent or poorly trained teachers, and you know the list goes on. Like I said, we have to keep digging until we find the root causes for our struggles. We must be the public that cares about public education. We must care for one another and we must hold one another accountable. We must not be lulled into complacency on matters of economic empowerment and uplift. We must know what we can and cannot afford, not just monetarily, but socially, we cannot afford to be more interested in the real housewives and whatever cities they live in than we are in the images we expose to our children. I was watching mu music videos one late night and I was appalled at the scantily clad young African-American women who were twerking and gyrating close to the camera. But I was heartbroken to learn later that African-American women directors had produced some of these videos. 
The other day I was, bearing, I was buying gas and the young man with huge rims on his car beside me had his music blasting with some of the most vulgar lyrics I'd ever heard. I kind of commented on them and he just looked at me and <laughs> kept pumping his $4 worth of gas. Sister Ida, she's calling us. Are we listening? Why does her voice matter in 2020 and beyond? She was fearless, she was a reformer, a game changer, an activist, and probably what President Trump would call a nasty woman. I call her a disruptor, someone who was relentless and refused to be silent. But today she's speaking to Russ College students, to the faculty, trustees, neighbors, and frenemies alike, to each of us personally, and to the masses from sea to shining sea. And she's telling us that the same maladies that plagued our world during her time they're still raising their ugly heads. At the heart of all that plagues us, confusion, dissension, inequity, the high-tech lynchings of our democracy and leaders, moral decay, hopelessness, the chaos and dismay, they're all symptoms of a system mired in racism and greed, but racism cannot be an excuse to let evil fester and grow. According to philosopher Edmund Burke, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good people do nothing. The good people cannot let evil and racism win. Mrs. Barnett is encouraging us to turn the light of truth on the wrongs within our world. You know, those distractions that continue to dog us and rob us of the focus and space we need to move forward. She vehemently opposed racism and violence and the oppression that came along with them. She courageously speaks truth to power to challenge us to educate ourselves so we don't have to settle for the dregs of society and live on the fringes. Her message over the past 89 years and beyond is that our efforts will matter when we stand strong and especially when we have to stand alone. She urges us to confront segregation and racism and banish them from every nook and cranny. She's urging us to stay in the fight even though it looks like we're down for the count. She poignantly reminds us, like her colleague Frederick Douglass, that power never concedes quietly or without a struggle. It never has and it never will. Today we can hear her voice in the cries of the children who are hungry and neglected. neglected. Are we listening? Today she is calling us to serve with compassion, with heart and commitment, and her pleading can be heard in the hallways of Russ College and beyond, as she reminds us to lift as we climb, to help move the race and this, for, and this country forward. Her broken heart is reminding us that all lynchings don't need a treat to kill and eviscerate the spirit. When we take the low road or settle for the crumbs instead of the whole pie, we lose sight of our hopes, and our dreams, of her hopes and dreams. Are we listening? During the creation of this lecture, I felt her spirit all around me. She was singing loudly through the heart of legendary activist Ella Baker and a song created for the Ella Baker Center. And the song is called, We Who Believe in Freedom Cannot Rest Until It Comes. The lines that spoke to me said, struggling myself don't mean a whole lot, I come to realize, that teaching others to stand up and fight is the only way my struggle survives. We must learn to stand strong and fight together. The songwriter, Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan, continues with, to me, young people come first. They have the courage where we fail. And if I can shed some light as they carry us through the gale, the older I get, the better I know that the secret of my going on is when the reins are in the hands of the young who dare to run against the storm. Russ College family, the reins are in our hands and we need to respect, weather, and run against the storms. Are we listening? President Barack Obama at the Democratic National Convention last week gently reminded us that what we do echoes through the generations, but are we listening? Mrs. Barnett is reminding us that this is our time, your time, my time, your time, our time. Will you register to vote and then not rest until you voted on election day? Will you do something 
when you see something wrong? Will you peacefully protest? And that is not the same thing as burning and looting. And will you actively support those issues you believe in? When you see justice denied, will you turn the other cheek or walk away? Because that's not your fight today. You make the difference. You are the difference. Whenever I leave home, I kiss my husband and he says, be careful. And I always reply, I'll do my part. Today, Mrs. Barnett and I are both asking, will you do your part? There may be dark days ahead, whether we get a Biden-Harris presidency or another Trump-Pence one. The road is going to be rough and the going will be tough and the hills are going to be hard to climb, but God has called us to go, to raise our voices, to speak up, to stand up, to be crusaders for justice. It is our time, your time, my time, our time. Are you listening?